Turn your Bibles to Genesis chapter 20, 32 uh, this morning, and as uh, we'll pick from there, a few verses from there, and then uh, we'll look at a, a life from there today. <clears throat> we title our series as God, our God is the God of underdogs. Everybody loves an underdog story. We always cheer for those who are underdogs. Some of you know, you, you know what it means by underdog, right? Somebody about whom we didn't, uh, we, 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 for, uh, you know, for whom we never gave a chance that this person would actually make it in their lives. We never thought that that, that person can per perform the way that they can perform. And yet, uh, it's almost as if from the back of line, they will start emerging as winners. Uh, and, you know, before anybody could even realize, they, they become the winners. They become the overcomers. Those are the ones we, uh, we call underdogs. And whenever we hear a story of an underdog, we love it. Everybody loves an underdog story. Everybody cheers uh, for an underdog. Why? Because somehow, deep down in our hearts, we all feel that we are underdogs. You know, we can identify with them. We also feel that uh, nobody gave us a chance. Nobody ever cheered up uh, for us. And yet, we, you know, uh, 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 you know so we are where we are today uh, by working hard, by, 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 by uh, honing our skills, in, in, you know, and uh, somehow by sheer um, grace of God, we have reached where we are. Um, we identify ourselves with, uh, with them. Um, in that sense, we're all underdogs. We're all underdogs. The thing is this. That every underdog has an excuse. We're all underdogs and we all have an excuse. You see, we have a tendency to hide behind our underdog excuses. Those logical, legitimate reasons as to why we shouldn't be the ones who, can, uh, who, who should be in that position. As to why this can't be done. Why we are not the one, why somebody else is the one, not you. Why we think we are, you know, we are disqualified and somebody else is more qualified than us. We have some kind of excuse and we always hide behind those excuses. Every great faith hero in the scripture had a reason not to become a hero. They are not born heroes, they are underdogs. If you look at each of their lives, you would begin to see they had, they had every opportunity to come up with an excuse to say, God, I can't do this. If you look at Moses, you would see Moses had a reason to say, God, I'm, no, I'm, not, I'm, no, I'm not the guy. I, I'm insecure. I, I, I'm incompetent as a leader. I, I, I couldn't even handle two people. How do you expect me to handle 600,000 of them at, at one time? I mean, I, I can't even take care of my sheep properly right now. I'm an incompetent leader. Or David would say, I'm, a, I'm, a dis, I'm, an, uh, I'm, a, I'm an unqualified king. I ca I'm a shepherd boy. I can't become a uh, you know, king. My father doesn't even think I can become a king. He, he doesn't think I'm a king material. Last week we looked at uh, Joseph. Joseph had every, every reason to give this excuse uh, that nobody recognizes my potential. Nobody recognizes my potential, so therefore, why, I, why should I even try it? Esther could say, my chances are slim. I am a Hebrew girl living, in a, living as a slave in a, in a different country. I never get a chance to become a queen. I, I don't think even if I become a queen, I don't think I, I can ever save Jewish people. She had, her chances were slim as a leader. A Gideon could say, my resources are too scarce. The task that you gave me is too big. My, the things that, the, the resources that I have in my hand are too scarce. Uh, it's too scarce. I don't even think I can achieve that. Paul would probably say, uh, when God asked him to go as a missionary to the Gentile world, Paul could say, God, my past is too bad. I'm not a missionary material. I don't think I can become a pastor. Uh, you, you know I murdered pastors. My past is too bad. John the Baptist would say, my dream is too radical. You are asking me to live 
as a completely different person from what society normally expects me to live like. Each of us, each of these heroes had an excuse behind which they could hide. And yet they chose not to let their excuses hold them back. They, 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 you know, some of them had legitimate reasons for, for not, being, not doing what they are doing, what they have done. They, they could have chosen not to do it when God asked them to do it. But they, yet they chose not to let their excuses to hold them back. They pursued their God-given dreams and that's what made them heroes in the first place. So we, we, it's time, I think, it's time, underdogs, that we need to rise up. Stop giving excuses. Stop hiding behind your excuses. In fact, you need to face your excuses head on and keep moving full, at full speed towards your God-given dream and destiny. This whole series is designed to challenge you to do that. We are not going to talk to you about how to become successful. We are going to talk to you from the lives of those who, who chose to face their excuses and became overcomers. We want to inspire you through this series that yeah, everybody is an underdog. Everybody has a reason. But what makes you a hero is that you choose not to let that excuse to stop you from doing what God asked you to do. Last week, we looked at one common excuse that we give. We give, we, we say that nobody recognizes my potential. Looking at Joseph's life, we saw how people can ignore our potential. How people can choose to say, choose to, you know, choose to uh, reject your potential and choose somebody else over you. Joseph had every reason to say, God, nobody recognizes my potential. I've got this gift. I've got this talent. I've got this skill. I can do better than everybody else. But looks like my boss doesn't care. What's worse is my own family doesn't recognize my potential. In fact, they are making fun of my dreams, my potential. He could have said that all these people don't recognize who I am and my potential. Why should I even try it? But yet... He chose to face his excuse and that's why he has become an overcomer. If you need um, that, that notes, I'm, I'm sure you would have gotten that notes as you walked in. If you still need it, we still have it uh, at our hosting with our hosts and they can give it to you uh, last Sunday's um, story of Joseph and what we have learned from his life. Today we're going to talk about second excuse that we do usually give. And I think it's a legitimate one, and some of us could actually identify ourselves with that. The second excuse that most people give is this, my reputation is too scarred. My reputation is too scarred. I want to be a good guy, but my reputation precedes me. What I have done in the past has always somehow managed to find a way to go before me to reach somebody else. So by the time I actually reach to my destination, there's, there's always somebody who already knows what I've done in the past. My reputation is too scarred. We live in a world that loves labeling people. It's fixated on labeling people. It's, you know, our society is quick to label anyone and everyone. I remember um, the first time I had to preach, I don't know if you shared this with you, before, if you heard from me, just hear it one more time. I love, this, I love sharing this particular story. That the first time that I preached in, the, in, in, in my Bible school, you know, every final year student is supposed to preach. And, um, you, know, it's, it's, you know, you can't escape that. It's kind of, you get marks for preaching. And so, as I was preparing for preaching, it's also um, traditional that uh, whenever a final year student is preaching, the third year student would lead the worship. That's, that's the practice. Uh, so for them, it's, you know, leading worship would be the marks. And for me, uh, preaching would be the marks. So um, I had this guy um, who comes from deep south, Tamil Nadu, and uh, he was leading the worship. And, and, and that guy was good. He led the worship. And, uh, and um, at the end of it, it's, it's a practice that the guy who leads the worship is the guy who introduces uh, the senior who's going to come on onto the stage and, and preach. And he would, uh, um, he, he likes me a lot. I mean, kind of. 
you know we we, we are not 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 exactly roommates we we kind of lived uh, at rooms that are opposite to each other and then um and we you we used to hang uh, hang out together and so um so in his enthusiasm in in, in introducing me uh, as a, as as the final year student who's going to preach now uh, and and all that excitement and then um he said hey put your hands together and welcome brother saitan on to the stage you can imagine the shocked reaction in the people right and for me <laughs> and you know you know deep south they can't pronounce cha so the only thing that he can say is sa uh, and uh, he just didn't he didn't at least he didn't say saitanya he just said saitan let's put our hands together and he stuck with me for the next 6 months uh, thankfully i graduated quickly <laughs> otherwise it would have stuck with me all my life we live in a world that is fixated with labels we label people based on their appearance if somebody looks a little little strong we call them pahilwan um or we we name people uh, by by the actions that they do you know i remember talking to our media guy and and he talked about yesterday uh, he talked about one name that stuck with him all through his schooling um nikkar narayana and uh, and uh, or we we name people by their profession like andrew is called sound raja but i don't know if you know this uh, I, so we we get names and they stay with us some of them are funny some of them are humorous they're good we actually might enjoy them but some of them are really mean they demean us they somehow put us down and they become our excuse because we begin to believe in them those labels in the old testament as we um as we come to genesis chapter 32 we find the story of a guy who was labeled like that right from the time he was born even though god desired for that person to be used in a great way he has been tagged from the birth with a label that just couldn't get away from him he just couldn't shake it off it stuck with him all through his life almost keeping him from reaching his destiny in chapter 32 of genesis let's jump there and and look at a passage and i want to uh, um take that as as the um starting point for our our message and then dry, dry, go back into his life genesis chapter 32 um 32 verses 22 to 27 during the night jacob got up took his two wives and two uh, and his two servant wives and his 11 sons and crossed the jabbok river with them after taking them to the other side he sent over all his possessions this left jacob all alone in the camp and a man came and wrestled with him until the dawn began to break when the man saw that he could not win the match he touched jacob's hip and wrenched it out of its socket then the man said let me go for the dawn is breaking but jacob said i will not let you go unless you bless me what is your name the man asked and he replied jacob let me pause there i'll come back to that passage in fact i'll come back to that chapter one more time later here is the big idea for today remember this that god desires to change our labels if we are willing to wrestle with him that's the lesson you and i need to learn today keep that in your if you can write down in your notes write it down the big lesson today is this that god desires to change our labels if we are willing to wrestle with him because never underestimate the power of a label that you carry out of the life of jacob jacob's life starts at genesis chapter 25 from there as we look at jacob's life we'll breeze through his life uh, you will begin to see there are few things that we can understand about labels i want to give you four observations that i've learned out of the life of jacob especially when it comes to labeling others number 1 the first one is this our labels can have a life altering effect on us our labels can have a life altering effect on us from the time he was born jacob was tagged 
we heard the word tag now it became more famous with our facebook but jacob was tagged from the time he was he was labeled from the worst part is it quite literally came from his own parents on the day he was born jacob was trying to up his brother you know by holding on to his knee probably in knee and probably wanted to come out uh, a heel and come, wanted to come out before um, brother um, uh, his brother isaac that moment that story marked jacob's life forever this little kid i don't know what his father thought about that moment i don't know what his, uh, what was running in isaac's uh, uh, head but he called him jacob jacob quite literally means an undercutter somebody who's you know cuts down others feet so that he can come up, come up. an undercutter an usurper taking somebody else's position a possession a deceiver how can a father name a son like that i don't know if he was uh, if he was um, he was he was in a humorous mood at that point of time that he looked at his son pulling down uh, isa's uh, feet and trying to come up and and just maybe by smiling he said jacob whether he did it with intention or unintention unintentionally he named him marked them forever it was uh, i mean i couldn't believe it. it was his parents that gave him that name can you imagine you know uh, your child is born and then you go to them and say i'm going to call you deceiver from today all all his life right every time jacob is going to uh, isaac is going to call his son he's going to go hey fellow cheater come here it affected his life from that moment on jacob's life talking about isaac labeling jacob i wanted to ask you this question have you ever labeled someone could be possible that somebody labeled you but i want to ask you this question have you ever labeled someone that you call them with a different name either for fun sake or for mocking sake for whatever reason you label somebody accidentally or innocently or intentionally i'm willing to bet that from that moment that person's life is changed it just dawned on to me as i was writing my uh, my notes it's crazy to consider that god can give you and me so much power that we can actually affect somebody else's life by labeling them do you understand the intensity of that that's why you know from from this pulpit every time i i i i i teach and and especially when it comes to parenthood i keep telling parents not to call our children useless fellows because they will become useless fellows or use words that you really don't want to happen in your children's life because they may actually become true they will affect their life to think that the very words that we speak without thinking can actually change somebody else's destiny forever and that's what happened in Jacob's case every one of us have uh, our own labels that have been put upon us at different points of our lives people gave different kinds of labels some we could shake them off but some stuck with us and began to dictate our lives i understand some of them are deliberate some of them are of our own mistakes it could probably be true about us but some are inadvertent um some are positive but some are not a misspoken word in a heated conversation would become a mark on somebody a name yelled in anger would become a mark on somebody else's life a tag given um to us from a frustrated friend or a parent begins to affect our lives just like jacob and for some well actually for many of us no matter how much we try we just can't seem to shake it off if it is positive it's good you know at least it'll 
it will direct you in a, in, a, in a different way. But what if it is a negative tag that we carry upon us? You see, we, uh, our labels can have a life-altering effect on us. Number two, the second thing that I want to, um, I have observed in Jacob's life is this, that we often are shaped by the labels we wear. We often are shaped by the labels we wear. If it's a positive change, it's good. There are times that I never believed in a purpose for my life. If there is one thing that I keep telling in this church, that um, if there is one thing that God called me to teach, um, uh, is this, that God, my, the purpose of my life is to tell others, you got a purpose for your life. That's the purpose of my life. So irrespective of where I go, what I do, this is all I'm called to do, to help people to understand that you have a God-given purpose. That you are not randomly born in this world. That you are not your parents' plan. You are here because God wants you to be here. And God has a very specific plan for your life. That's all God asked me to teach. All my life. That I had because somebody else taught me that. Somebody out of the blue, when I was at my lowest point of my life, probably thinking that I don't deserve to be, to be you know, with the parents that I am with, I don't deserve to be uh, having the kind of blessing that I have, maybe I should consider taking my life out. Uh, somebody sitting with me, just out of the blue said, uh, you are like, a, like an arrow in the quiver of God, from the book of Isaiah. He just, out of the blue, he just opened it and he, and he read it. And he said, uh, he's become my close friend now. He opened it and he just read that and he said, um, your life has a purpose, Chaitanya. He had no idea that the previous night I have attempted suicide. That he had no idea that I actually took sleeping pills that, that the previous night and, and you know, God somehow managed to save me. And, uh, and uh, while we were sitting outside at, at, at a playground in the Bible school, this is happening in Bible school, and he was sitting beside me, and he, uh, I don't know what he thought. He, he had a Bible in his hand. He just opened it and just read that verse. God stuck in my head. It changed me forever. It shaped um, um, my life from that moment. And everything that I began to do, I began to look at it. Okay, if God asked me to do something... It means that God has a purpose through that and God wants me um, to use that opportunity to help others. So some words that come from others, some labels that people give us will stick with us. You're like an arrow in the quiver of God. you got a purpose. Just stay with me. But some could be really affecting us in an adverse way like Jacob. Jacob wanted to change his label, but his life somehow was shaped by the tag that was given to him. Throughout Jacob's childhood, he lived up to uh, his name. It affected him. I'm sure growing up, Jacob saw that, um, that, that he, he was who his name was. He is now becoming what his name says. Every time the mom would talk about um, how the children are born, I'm sure Jacob is reminded of his trickery, the nature that he had inside him. He just had been named as a liar, as an undercutter, as a deceiver. Every time mom is talking to him, every time dad is calling him, he is reminded, he, it is reinforced upon him that he is a deceiver. At, uh, at one point, he, he, he tricked his older brothers in uh, Esau in giving him the birthright. Now, birthright in Jewish culture is a very important thing. The being firstborn is a, is a very precious thing, especially for a male uh, firstborn. So he tricked his elder brother to give the birthright uh, f uh, f from, uh, f for the family. Later he tricked his own father to get the blessing so that he can have that family blessing upon himself. He was always in a war of deception with his father-in-law, Laban. 
Always. Of course, Laban was worse than him. Jacob. Because he always, you know, outmaneuvered uh, Jacob. But Jacob was always at loggerheads with, with Laban and trying to deceive him. No matter how, what Jacob tried to do, as you look through his life, he just couldn't get rid of his labor. He was an usurper. He remained a deceiver. He remained a cheat and a liar. He allowed his name to dictate his life. No matter what he tried, he just couldn't make the change necessary to get a different outcome from his life. The labels we wear shape what we become, who we become. And eventually, who we are catches up, catches up with us at some point. Have you ever been labeled by somebody and you began to allow that label to shape your life today? Because you believed it. You assumed that's who you are and your decisions, your actions, everything that you do is now driven by that label. Since everybody thinks I am like this, let me be like this. Since everybody says I am like this, let me be like this. Maybe that's how I need to survive in this world. That's how he tried to live his life all through his journey. Till you come to chapter 32 uh, verses 25, Jacob lived his life trying to shake off, but he couldn't shake off and trying, you know, he just molded himself into what his name says. In fact, that's my third observation. It's, it's this, that we can allow our labels to paralyze our future. We can allow, uh, allow our labels to paralyze our future. Short circuit our future, if you want to call it. The same chapter, chapter 32, verses 9 to 18, has an interesting thing unfolding. In fact, by the time you come to chapter 32, uh, uh, Jacob has somehow managed to shake off his father-in-law and he's now moving towards his homeland. But he knows this. He knows that he's got a bigger problem at the, uh, at, at, at the homeland. He's got his elder brother waiting for him to kill him. Because, of course, he cheated his elder brother first of the birthright. Then he cheated his elder brother along with his father for the blessing that elder brother should get. Uh, so he knew that his life is in danger. So he sent out his servants beforehand. By the time you come to chapter 32, verses 3, you would see some of the servants are being sent by Jacob ahead to meet Esau. Take some gifts with him, with them and meet Isa and say, Hey, your brother Jacob is coming. He's now become a rich man. He's, he's got properties. He's got blessing. And he wants to come back home and make peace with you. They, come, they came back Jacob, to, to Jacob. By the time you come to verse 7, you'd see these people came to, came to Jacob and told him, Hey, Jacob, we did what you asked me to do. Now Isa is coming. He has taken 400 men, strong men along with him and he's coming. It didn't sound pleasing to Jacob. He knew this is dangerous. He knew Isa is still angry with him. He knew 400 mighty men, meaning this fellow is going to kill me. My brother is going to kill me. And so this, this is what he began to do. He began to divide up his property and everything that he's got into two parts. And he sent one ahead of him. Kept the other with him. And then he began to pray to God. Look at how he prays to God. Chapter 32, verses 9. He's talking to God. Then Jacob prayed. Oh God, God of my grandfather Abraham and God of my father Isaac, oh Lord, you told me, return to your own land and to your relatives. And you promised me that I will treat you kindly. I am not worthy of all the unfailing love and faithfulness you have shown to me, your servant. When I left home and crossed the Jordan River, I owned nothing except for a walking stick. Now, my household is filled with two large camps. Listen to what he's saying. My household is filled with two large camps. It was one large camp. He's the one who divided it into two large camps. Okay, Think with me. And, I, um, um, and he's saying, Oh Lord, please rescue me from the hand of my brother, Isa. Let me just pause there. I want to rephrase his prayer. 
it looks really good the prayer looks very sincere even at the most sincere point of prayer time he is still trying to deceive god did you see that first of all he is telling god this god i'm in trouble you are the one who asked me to come you saw what he is doing he is saying to say i didn't want to come but you told me to come to this land so i'm coming along with all the property that i'm taking and coming you are the one who promised that you're going to bless me in the new land so i'm coming now i'm in trouble because my brother is trying to kill me and my family is divided into two large camps if not for my sake at least for these mummies and children please save me that's what he's saying that's his prayer Didn't we pray prayers, prayers like that with God? It's almost as if he's trying to mm, manipulate God and twist the hand of God to help him. Even in his prayer, he just couldn't stop being himself. That's how much our labels affect us, huh? in his voice you can see that you know it looks like a sincere prayer but it you can see the manipulation in his voice i am afraid that he is coming to attack me along with my wives and children but you promise me that i will surely treat you kindly and i will multiply your descendants until they become as numerous as sands along with the seashore too many too many to count Now wait a second you can look at me and say no no you are trying to twist that prayer you could look at me and say that it it actually is sincere prayer i would agree with you if not for the next verse it was the next verse that kind of gave me the hint that his prayer is also manipulating look at what he did jacob stayed where he was for the night then he selected these gifts from his possessions to present to his brother he saw 200 look at what he is give, giving gift as a gift uh, to his brother 200 female goats 20 male goats 200 eaves 20 rams 30 female camels with their young 40 cows 10 bulls 20 female donkeys and 10 male donkeys he divided all these animals into herds and assigned each to different servants then he told the servants go ahead of me with these animals but keep some distance between the herds so he's got like this number of things that he was trying to send to his brother but he told them every one of you take your herd and keep a distance between each of you why because if my brother encounters the first group the first group would say hey this is your brother sending you this gift there is more coming and then as isa moves forward he sees the second group the second group would the same thing. in fact that's what he instructed to tell jacob uh, isa by the way i i didn't read the entire passage but i'm just trying to give you heads up so the second group would say hey this is a gift from for, for you from for, from your brother there's more coming so in you know this this process of bribery happening did you see that so that the brother can cool down by the time he reaches there This guy is thinking I prayed but what if God doesn't do it let me come up with a different plan So a scheming prayer and bribery finally a deception the deception of different groups coming at different different times is are thinking oh so much my brother is giving to me You see this I I I don't know if he believed in the promise that God actually gave him that I'm going to prosper you and bless you. I'm sure he's not sure of God's promise. He was more afraid of Isa, he was more afraid of all the actions that he has done, his reputation going up ahead of him and catching up with him, uh so he turned to his familiar path which is deceiving others. Uh including trying to deceive God and paralyzing his future. he could have paralyzed short circuited his future with that if i can't get god listen to me then i'll try to bribe my brother isa i'll try and pay him off in advance probably that's what he's thinking yeah. it's possible that you completely 
can identify with Jacob, some of us, or maybe all of us. That you know what is it to have a label placed upon you and how it defines you. And as much as you have tried, no matter how hard you fought uh, uh, that label or denied it, you just can't seem to shake it off. In fact, you've been tempted to believe that you're going to carry uh, this label almost like a, like a tattoo on your, on, your, on your body all your life. What's more, you probably are even tempted to believe that you're going to take this label to your grave. But the fourth truth is this. You are more than your label. You are more than your label. Doesn't matter what the world is calling you. Doesn't matter what your friends are calling you. Doesn't matter what you think you are because of the label that was given to you. You are not your label. You are more than that. Because here is the point. By the time you come to chapter 32 verses 22, Jacob had realized that it is God and God alone who can change his life. Only God could change Jacob. Only God can change your label. Because we serve a God who is bigger than any of my label, any label that is placed upon me. There's hope for you. There's hope for me that God can change your label. Because you're more than your, more than your label. See, uh, you and I need to realize that, that we serve a God who is able to remove labels that are stuck on us like a tattoo. He can remove them too. Without a trace. We serve a God who removes them from underdogs like you and me every day. Every day. At the end of all his scheming and deceiving, Jacob knew deep down what he needed was God. And that's why even in the morning, even in the night, as he sent away his family and the rest of the position that he's got, he chose to stay back, probably saying, I'm going to ask God to help me now. And God came, truly God came to help him. There are three things that Jacob did in those few verses that we have read this morning that, um, that probably we need to learn today and practice them. Three things. Number one, he wrestled with God. He wrestled with God. Jacob was desperate for God to remove once and for all all the labels that he's got that hung around his neck uh, like a noose. He was so desperate that he held on to God so much, so long, that he just wouldn't let go, that God had to break his hip. When was the last time that you, 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 you decided, I am, I'm going to sit down, I'm going to start praying, I'm going to fast, I'm going to fight with God so much that this would happen? When was the last time you did that? That this habit is, is, is killing me. This habit is taking me away from God. I'm going to fight this. I'm going to get rid of this, 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 this sin that is in my life. I'm going to fight with God to get this right. When was the last time you did that? You probably did it for one day. You probably thought, let me fast for one meal and then God would somehow make everything right. And if nothing happened, just gave up. So I'm going to challenge you to do this. You got like this whole week and the context is so set, well set for us. This Passion Week gives you an opportunity to fast and to struggle, fight with God. Wrestle with God for the problem that you got in your life. Wrestle with God to get off, get rid of that label that is in your life. Wrestle with God to get rid of the sin that is marking you. Because God can do that. This whole week you got an opportunity to fast and pray and fight with God. 
He did that. He never let go off. Even when God broke his hip, he said, no, 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 I'm not going to leave you. It could be possible that your fight with God could mark you physically. And yet it's better to have that mark than a label that is hanging around your, no- your neck all the time. He wrestled with God. Number two, he was willing to admit who he really was. He was willing to admit who he really was. What was the question God asked him? What's your name? Don't you think God knows that? By the way, the man there is pre-incarnated Jesus who had actually come down to uh, encounter with Jacob, has, has an encounter with Jacob. He was willing to admit. What was the question? What's your name? Not that the man doesn't know his name, not that God doesn't know his name, but he wanted Jacob to tell who he really was. Admit who he really was. In order for Jacob to change the label that hung over his life, God knew Jacob first has to admit his label. That's the power of confession, by the way. The reason we ask you to confess is because there is power in that. You will feel, there is freedom, you know, when you actually are able to say, God, this is who I am, but I want to change. Until, listen to this, until we are willing to admit who we really are, we can never become who God wants us to be. Until we are willing to admit who we really are, we will, we will never become who God wants us to be. So you might want to say, I'm Jacob. My name is Deceiver. That's what he said. My name is Deceiver. I'm a liar. You want to know who I am, God? I'm a manipulator. I'm the one person nobody trusts. I'm the one um, everybody, everybody labels as a bad kid the black sheep of the home, the the useless fellow of the home. I am the guy nobody trusts, nobody is willing to believe in. And in fact, I begin to live like that. You want to know who I am, God? Well, guess what? This is what I am, a manipulator. When was the last time you actually said that to God? Admitted who you are. There is power in confession. Remember that. He wrestled with God. He was willing to admit who he really was. Number three, he chose to believe what God said after he confessed. He chose to believe what God said about him. Don't miss what's happening here. On the surface, that can look like a simple name change. And God said the next verse, he promised him and he said, from now, your name is not going to be Jacob. Your name is going to be Israel because you have fought with man, you fought with God and you won. You're an overcomer. Isn't that what he said? Don't think it's just a name change, but something supernatural is taking place. When you confess truthfully, God begins to work in your life and begins to change you. Inside out. Jacob, from now on, you will no longer wear the label you've been, you've been wearing from, from, from the time you were born. Today, I'm giving you a new name, new label. You're called Israelite, Israel. You, you, are, you struggle with God, you struggle with human beings, and you never let it get best, of, best out of you. Uh, in fact, the label you once wore, you will never again wear. You see, Jacob chose to believe that and that's the transformation point. When Jacob wrestled with God, he confessed his label and God began to change his life. Once Jacob believed what God told about him, then Jacob was ready to be blessed. That's when Jacob really received true blessing. You know, he, he already had job, he already made a lot of money, he's got a lot of stuff. But that didn't matter, that was not the blessing at all. The real blessing now, came now, 
when God changed him inside out and said, hey, all that you made, that's not the blessing. This is the blessing. Now you will truly be blessed. If there is one thing that I, I, I recognize in Jacob's life is this. That all his life has been a struggle. Struggle for acceptance right from the beginning. Struggle for acceptance. It was a struggle for blessing. It was a struggle for faith. When he was all alone uh, working under Laban, he, he didn't have anybody to, uh, to, to believe in, trust in. He had to believe on God, rely on God. It was a struggle for love. And it was a struggle for success. It could be possible that your life is a struggle because uh, of the label that you, that you have. Now here is something that I want you to remember. Until, you, until we realize our struggle really is with God, you will keep struggling all your life. With everybody around you. Until you realize that your struggle is really with God, you'll keep struggling all your life with everybody around 